Alright, in today's video, we are going to be talking about monetary policy. So, monetary policy is a practice where a monetary authority controls the money supply often to target a certain level of interest rates so that they can achieve certain macroeconomic goals. Let's break things down so that it be easier to understand. Now, let's take a look at monetary authority. So, the monetary authority here actually refers to the central bank in a particular country. So, the central bank is the bank of all the banks, right? It's a mother of all banks. So, let's take a look at the USA. So, in the USA, the central bank is known as the Federal Reserve. Nope, it is not the Bank of America. The Bank of America is just, you know, one of the regular banks doing consumer investment banking and commercial banking, what have you. In Singapore, the central bank is known as the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Well, it's not the Bank of Singapore. Bank of Singapore is the private banking arm of OCBC Bank, okay? And in the United Kingdom, the central bank is the Bank of England. So when we talk about controlling the money supply, there are actually three ways in which the central bank can do this, but we're going to talk about this only later. So to understand what it means to control the money supply, let's take a look at the money market diagram. So the money supply curve is the vertical straight line that you see over there. So increasing the money supply would look like this, bringing the interest rates down. And reducing the money supply would look like this, bringing the interest rates up. And that brings me to the next point on targeting a level of interest rates. Okay, So uh, why do we do this? Well, that is because the central bank wants to stimulate either an increase or a decrease in aggregate expenditure. And you should already know by now that interest rates would affect the amount of investment spending in an economy. And that is how the aggregate expenditure is going to be stimulated. So we know that investment spending has a negative relationship with your interest rates. So if the central bank somehow manages to reduce the interest rate level, this would increase investments, hence an increase in AE and output. And if we go the other way around, then you would have a decrease in AE as well as output. Okay, and in some cases, consumption can also be stimulated with the interest rates. So this is only when the consumption function is a function of not only your disposable income, but interest rates at the same time. So we include interest rates only when the question states so, right? So the disposable income has a positive relationship with consumption, which means that if disposable income increases, consumption will increase. And just like investment, consumption might have a negative relationship with interest rates. So that is how affecting the interest rates is going to stimulate either an increase or a decrease in aggregate expenditure. And there are two types of macroeconomic goals that I can think of. The first one would be to cool an economic boom. Okay, we're talking about cooling down the economy. So just to recap, an economic boom occurs when the level of GDP is higher than the natural rate of GDP. Okay, and why would we want to cool down this economy? Well, that's because we want to reduce inflation, right? Inflation isn't exactly good. And what you're going to need is a contractionary monetary policy, which means that you reduce the GDP level in the country so that you reach its natural level again. So the second type of macroeconomic goal would be to recover from a recession, which occurs when the GDP is lesser than the natural level. Okay, the problem is that you're going to have a lot of unemployment, so you want to reduce the level of unemployment through an expansionary monetary policy. So basically, you increase the GDP level so that there'll be more spending, more jobs will be going around. Okay, so that's a breakdown of what monetary policy is about. Now, if you recall from the video in the fiscal policy, um, we talked about an ISLM analysis that is too simple and does not show any understanding of the mechanics and the intuition behind the IS curve and the LM curve. So now we're going to talk about the ISLM mechanics in detail uh, and we're going to have to consider the effects of both the goods market as well as your money market. All right? This was somewhat discussed in the previous video. So in the goods market, just to recap, you're going to be using the Keynesian cross diagram which gives birth to your IS curve and for the money market, you're going to be using the money market diagram which gives birth to your LM curve. Okay, so let's take a look at the diagrams and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set up my initial equilibrium. You're going to notice that there's going to be an ISLM model and on top of it is going to be my Keynesian cross diagram and on the left side, that's my money market model. Okay, so just to remind you again, 
um, the diagrams on the top and the left, so the Keynesian cross diagram and the money market diagram, you do not have to show this when you are attempting exam questions. Okay? Um, the most important part is the dynamics within the ISLM model itself. So the reason why we have the Keynesian cross and the money market diagram here is just to facilitate your understanding of the mechanics behind the ISLM model. Okay, so let's look at the case of an expansionary monetary policy. So the central bank is going to increase the supply of nominal money in this economy, causing the real money supply to increase, which means that the real money supply curve is going to shift to the right. Okay, so in your money market diagram, shift the real money supply curve to the right. Okay, and what you're going to get here is an excess supply of money. Okay, so how is the money market going to clear? So basically, your interest rates are going to fall so that we move from point A to point B. Okay, so in the money market, the interest rates falls to I1, which clears the money market. Okay, so take note that to this point, there is no change in the income level. Therefore, the LM curve is going to shift vertically downwards because at every level of income, the interest rates is now lower due to the increase in money supply. Okay, so point B will be somewhere here. And your LM curve is going to shift down. So this is LM1, M1, comma, P0. So now that we have cleared the money market, let's talk about the Keynesian cross diagram. So you notice that interest rates has fallen, so investment will rise. AE will then increase, therefore you need to shift the AE curve upwards and income is expected to rise as well. Okay, so this will happen until you reach the new ISLM equilibrium, which is over here at point C. So what you want to do is to identify what be the final level of output, which is um, Y1 over here. So what you're going to do now is you're just going to shift your AE curve up here. Okay, so we call that point C. And this curve over here is going to be known as AE2. The interest rate level will be I2 and this is A bar 2. Now, I know that this sounds a little bit odd. Where did AE1 go to? Well, I'm going to explain to you in a while and you'll also be wondering, hey, I thought the interest rate level is at I1. Why is it I2? Well, I'm going to explain later, so just hang on to your horses, yeah? So from this point, we can safely say that the new level of output is going to be Y1, but there is also going to be a new level of interest rates determined by the new ISLM equilibrium, and that is I2. Okay, so you know that in a money market, you're going to have to be at point C. You have to be at point C because you need the money supply and the money demand to intersect at that point C to give you your interest rates level of I2. So how do we do this? Some of you might be thinking, why don't you just move the demand curve to the right? Well, we need a reason to move the demand curve to the right. So you see, the increase in income will lead to an increase in the money demand. So that is why the demand curve is going to shift to the right and intersect at point C with the money supply curve. So the new demand curve is called L1, Y1. Okay, so this is the entire mechanism over here. So let's go back to the ISLM model and see how the movement goes. So there's going to be a movement from point A to point C along the IS curve because there is an increase in investment due to the reduction of the in interest rates. And there is also going to be an upward movement along the LM curve from point B to point C because of the clearing of the money market where your interest rates rise from I1 to I2. Now let me show you where is AE1. So AE1 is going to be over here. Okay, AE1 actually corresponds to a interest rates level of I1. So what you'll notice is that the AE curve actually shifts up and then instantly is going to shift down immediately after it reaches AE1. So why is this the case? Okay, so the upward movement is due to this. The interest rates I0 decrease to I1 and this caused my investments to increase. Therefore, my AE curve shift up. Right, now the reason for it to shift down again is because interest rates I1 increased to I2. Therefore, my investment is then going to fall, causing my AE curve to shift down. So as you can see, this is the reason for the up and then immediately down movement of the AE curve. So that is the end of all the dynamics. Just recall that this circle portion over here has got all the important dynamics that you need to explain when you shift the LM curve downwards. Okay. So now let's move on to the case whereby we have a contractionary monetary policy instead. Okay, I need to wait for me to finish drawing the initial equilibrium because this is the fastest that I can speed the video up. Okay, so we're finally done. Now, 
in a case where there is a contractionary monetary policy, the central bank actually reduces the nominal money supply, which again reduces the real money supply. Therefore, you're going to shift this vertical line over to the left and call it MS1 over P0. Okay, obviously MS1 is smaller than MS0. So what you see here is an excess demand for money. Okay, so for the money market to clear, the interest rates will have to rise, bringing us to point B in the money market diagram. And the new interest rates level is now I1. Okay, so take note that there has been no change in the GDP level whatsoever. So the LM curve is going to shift directly, vertically upwards, okay? Because at every level of out output, the interest rate level is now higher due to the reduction in the money supply. And because of that, point B on the ISLM model is going to be over there. And this is my new LM curve, LM1 bracket M1 P0. Okay, now that we have temporarily taken care of the money market diagram, let's go to the Keynesian diagram. So the increase in interest rates is going to cause investment to fall, hence my AE is going to fall as well. So I have to shift the AE curve down, causing income to fall, and the income will continue to fall until we reach the new and final ISLM equilibrium, which is over here at point C. So we're going to bring down point C and notice that the new income level is going to be at Y1, so that's point C. Okay. And this is the new AE curve, it's AE2 um, corresponding to an interest rates level of I2 and I'm going to explain again where is AE1 at the end of all these dynamics. So in the new ISLM equilibrium, we are also going to have a new level of interest rates over here. And the new level of interest rates is going to be I2. In the money market diagram, we need to show that the new equilibrium gives us an interest rates level of I2. So we need to shift the money demand curve to the left, and we need an explanation for that as well. So do you remember that there was this decrease in income? So this decrease in income is going to cause the money demand to fall, therefore the money demand curve is going to shift left. Okay, so now we've got a good reason to shift it left. This is my new and final demand curve for the money, and it's going to be L1, Y1, and the final equilibrium is going to be point C. Going back to the ISLM model, there will be a movement along the IS curve from point A to point C. And this is due to investment falling, as shown in the Keynesian cross diagram. And looking at the LM curve, there will be a movement along the LM curve from point B to point C. And this is due to the clearing of the money market where interest rates fall from I1 to I2. So where is AE1? So AE1 is actually over here, and AE1 corresponds to an interest rate level of I1. Okay? And there has been a downward shift and then immediately an upward shift of the AE curve. Why is this so? Firstly, your interest rates at I0 actually increased to I1. This caused your investment level to fall, hence AE will fall, so the AE shifted down from AE0 to AE1. Secondly, the interest rates I1 decreased to I2. This then increased your investment level and your AE curve is going to shift Okay, so that's the reason what behind the um, down and then instantaneously going up of the AE curve. Now that we are done with the ISLM mechanics, we can now talk about the three ways in which the central bank can control the money supply in the economy. The first way in which the central bank can control the money supply is through open market operations. So in short, we call this OMO. OMO. Okay, so OMO occurs when the central bank buys or sells government bonds from the open market. That's why it's called open market operations. So open market here actually refers to financial markets. More specifically, we're talking about the bonds market and the major players in the financial markets are of course the banks. Okay, so here's a simple flow diagram on how open market operations work. Okay, so you've got a central bank here and you have the open market here, which is made up of all the financial markets. So the open market sells government bonds to the central bank, and in return, the central bank is going to pay money to the open market, right? When you buy something, you're going to pay. So all this money actually goes into the reserves of the banks, okay? And the bank's reserves are simply going to increase. And when the banks realize that they've got more reserves, they can make more loans. And because more money is circulating around the economy due to more loans, the money supply is going to increase. So as you can see, buying bonds in the open market is actually an expansionary monetary policy by the central bank. Now let's take a look at the opposite scenario where the central bank sells government bonds to the open market. So the open market will have to pay the central bank money 
Okay, and when that happens, the reserves of the banks, okay, which is being used to pay for the bonds, decrease, causing the loans amount to decrease, therefore the money supply to decrease. So as you can see, the act of the central bank selling government bonds to the open market is a form of contractionary monetary policy. So that is how, ladies and gentlemen, open market operations is done. The second way in which a central bank can control the money supply is to change the required reserve ratio it implies on the banks. Okay, so the required reserve ratio is known as alpha. So the money supply is defined as M1, which is the sum of the amount of public cash plus the reserves multiplied by 1 over alpha. So 1 over alpha here actually refers to your deposit multiplier. Okay, if you're not sure why this is the deposit multiplier, please go back and watch the video on the demand and supply of money. So when I increase alpha, the money supply is going to decrease. The intuition behind this is simple. If the banks have to now keep more money into the vaults, that means they have lesser cash to lend out, right? So when they got lesser cash to lend out, there are lesser loans that are being made in the economy. So the money circulating in the economy then falls, okay? So as you can see, this is contractionary. When the central bank increases alpha, increases the required reserve ratio, this is a form of contractionary monetary policy. So in the case where the central bank reduces the required reserve ratio, the money supply will eventually increase. And the intuition behind this is that since the banks do not have to hold that much cash in their vaults, they have more money to lend out to the public, right? So when there are more money lent to the public, there is going to be more loans. More loans means there's going to be more uh, money that's circulating the economy. So this is an example of an expansionary monetary policy where the central bank decreases the required reserve ratio. And the last way that the central bank can control the money supply is to change the discount rate. To explain the discount rate, I have to go to an example in the video of the demand and supply of money. Okay, so recall that in the example in that video, uh, we talked about the Federal Reserve depositing K amount of dollars into Merrill Lynch, right? So effectively, the Fed is lending Merrill Lynch K amount of money. So Merrill Lynch will actually have to pay interest to the Fed for K amount of money. Now, this interest rate here does not refer to the market interest rate, which you find in the ISLM model. So this interest rate here is known as the interbank rate. It is the interest rates that the banks use when they lend and borrow to one another. Okay, so in London, they call it the LIBOR, and in Singapore, they call it the CYBOR. So let's take a look at how banks make money. How do banks become rich? So the banks make money when the interest that they earn from lending people money is higher than the interest that they pay for borrowing that money. So let's take a look at a mathematical example so that you can understand this better. So let's say Merrill Lynch borrows $1,000 from the Federal Reserve at a 5% interest rate. But Merrill Lynch is going to lend Mr. Cash that same $1,000 at an interest rate level of 10%. So let's calculate the profits for Merrill Lynch. So it's going to be 10% multiplied by the $1,000 minus the 5% multiplied by the same $1,000. Okay, so what you're going to get after factorizing is you're going to get 5% of $1,000. So 5% is their profit margin. So they're going to get a profit of $50 if they were to make this um, loan to Mr. Cash. So the interbank rate is also commonly known as the discount rate, right? So if the central bank were to reduce this discount rate, what will happen is that the amount of loans in this economy is going to increase. Okay, so here's the reason why the amount of loans is going to increase. Let's say Merrill Lynch wants to maintain its profit margin of 5%. Now that the discount rate has fallen, um, the Merrill Lynch can actually lend money at a lower interest rates, but still making 5% of a profit margin. So with this lower amount of interest rates that people can borrow money at, there will be more loans that's going to be made out, right? When loans are cheaper, of course, you are going to have more loans. Okay, so that's the reason behind why there's going to be more loans when the discount rate falls. So when there are more loans going around in this economy, the money supply is going to increase. As you can see, decreasing the discount rate is an expansionary monetary policy. So increasing the discount rate will cause the amount of loans to fall. Okay, and when there are lesser loans, the money supply will then fall. So as you can see, Increasing the discount rate is a contractionary monetary policy. 
Of all the three ways that the central bank can control the money supply, open market operations is the most popular method that has been adopted around the world. So one question is, for the central bank to pay money to the open market, where does it get the money from? Well, the answer is that it prints its own money. All right, it prints currency. Okay, and the problem with printing money is that there's going to be inflation in the long run. Inflation will be talked about in the next chapter. Okay, but for now, let's move on to the last branch of this mind map. Let's talk about the effectiveness of policies. To measure the policy effectiveness, we use one simple metric. Okay, and that metric is the size of the change in the GDP after the implementation of this policy. And the size of the change in GDP depends on the slope or the gradient of the IS curve or the LM curve. But for this syllabus, we'll be focusing more on the gradient of the IS curve. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a simple economy, a closed economy with lump sum taxes, and I'm going to derive the IS curve equation. So I'm going to skip the steps to speed up this video, and I have this string of um, algebra over here and this makes up the IS curve equation for a simple economy close economy with lump sum taxes so this portion over here is my vertical intercept and this portion over here is my gradient so let's just say that c1 increases this is going to cause the gradient to decrease and at the same time it is going to cause the vertical intercept to decrease as well okay so your IS curve is going to be flatter. So graphically, what you're going to see is that, okay, you've got an initial IS curve at IS0. So this IS curve is going to become flatter like this. So the question is, where should we pivot the IS curve to show the rotation? The location where we pivot the IS curve matters because we're going to be using this to actually identify the effectiveness of the policy. Okay, so let's take a look at this initial equilibrium. Okay, so the initial level of output is going to be over here, point A, why not? So I will recommend that you pivot your IS curve on the initial equilibrium point A. Let me show you the reason why. Assume that there is an expansionary monetary policy and the LM curve shifts down to LM1. Okay, so point B is the new equilibrium, the final equilibrium, skipping all the detailed steps and my new level of output is at y1. If I had a flatter IS curve which pivoted on point A, what you realize is that I'm going to have a higher level of output at point B prime, which is y2. So what I can conclude is that with a flatter IS curve, my monetary policy is more effective because the change in output is larger. This means that y2 minus y0 is larger than y1 minus y0. You can see in the graph over here. Now, let's say we do not pivot the IS curve along point A. We just pivot it somewhere else, and we're going to get IS not double prime. So the A double prime is now my new initial equilibrium. After the monetary policy, we will end up at point B double prime. So now we have got Y0 and Y1, but hey, where's Y2? Well, there is no Y2. So you see, that is why you should pivot your new IS curve along point A. So that you're going to get Y0, Y1, and Y2, which gives you a better analysis on whether the policy is effective or not. And that brings me to the end of this video. I would like to thank you for studying with Quickonomics.